Well, hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to Conversations with Jay Sky. Today, we're going to be discussing um, a paper entitled Short-Term Deaths After PCI Discharge, uh, Prevalence, Risk Factors, and Hospital Risk-Adjusted Mortality. Uh, this was uh, first authored by uh, Dr. Hannon at the University of Albany, and I'm joined uh, by two wonderful panelists, Dr. Jacobs at Boston Medical Center and Dr. Hirschfeld, the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania. Thank you all for being here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the, uh, the talk over to you, Dr. Hannon, to uh, present your findings, and we'll have a little discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is the title of the paper. Again, uh, Dr. Barron just uh, mentioned this. There is not a lot known about people who die shortly after discharge from uh, procedures, particularly uh, PCI. And what I mean is that a lot of times there are... Uh, measures or in hospital 30-day mortality. But when those measures are quoted, um, everything is put together. You don't know how much is in hospital, how much occurs after discharge. And so the purpose of this study is to take a look at these people who die shortly after discharge in terms of um, how they differ from ones who die in hospital, uh, how they are part of the quality measure for PCI, uh, what can be done to try to improve quality based on information, more information about them. Uh, and we, to do this, we use the New York State uh, PCI registry to find these deaths that occurred after discharge, but within 30 days between uh, 2015 and 2017. Took a look at the patient risk factors for these patients and also at the risk-adjusted mortality and outlier status for patients who die in the hospital, ones who die after discharge, and ones who die either in the hospital or after discharge in order to try to get a handle on how these patients are different, but also how uh, using these after discharge deaths would impact uh, assessments of hospital quality. And so altogether uh, in this time period uh, of the patients we took a look at, about one and a half percent died within 30 days of the procedure, either in hospital or after discharge. And a little over a third of those deaths occurred after discharge. And of the ones that occurred after discharge, uh, around almost a third of them died in the hospital, which uh, accounted for 10% of all the deaths that occurred within 30 days. When I say in the hospital, I mean um, in readmission. And uh, this 34% of patients who died uh, after discharge rose to 54% when we took a look at non-emergency patients. So it's a much higher percentage of patients dying after discharge among non-emergencies. Um, the patients who, trans who were transferred to other than home also had very high mortality, um, much higher than patients who were discharged home. This uh, was both for patients with um, who were discharged to nursing homes and ones who were discharged to other acute care hospitals, nearly five times as high mortality after risk adjustment as patients who were discharged home. Also patients who had rural residences uh, had higher mortality compared to patients without rural res residences. Um, the discharges to other than home uh, were not that many patients, there were only three and a half percent of them, but they comprised a very large percent of all of the deaths uh, that occurred after discharge. This chart takes a look at the impact of looking at in-hospital 30-day mortality versus in-hospital mortality. The first thing that's done here is to take a look at um, deaths that occur after discharge versus deaths that occur in the hospital. Now, no one would ever advocate for only assessing hospital quality based on deaths that occur after discharge within 30 days. But the purpose of taking a look at these first two columns is to show that uh, when, you, when you take a look at the outliers, the hospitals that have significantly higher and significantly lower mortality rates, there are no outliers in common between the ones, uh, the deaths that occur outside the hospital after discharge and the ones that occur in hospital. So it's a very different. Uh, set of quality assessments for hospitals for deaths that occur in these two different locations. The second and the third column are uh, relevant in the sense that 
the two measures that have been advocated and been used in most settings for assessing hospital short-term hospital mortality are in-hospital mortality and uh, in-hospital 30-day mortality, meaning occurring in the hospital at any time or within 30 days anywhere. And here too, you can see that um, there is not a lot of correspondence between using those two measures in terms of um, hospital assessments. The total number of, um, of outliers, this is looking at low outliers, hospitals that have significantly lower mortality than the statewide average. There's a total of uh, seven uh, low outliers for in-hospital 30-day mortality. There are 10 hospitals that were designate or the, that were identified as being uh, hot, uh, low outlier hospitals in either using either the in-hospital mortality measure or the in-hospital 30-day mortality. And out of those 10 hospitals, only four of them were in common for the two measures. And uh, for high outliers, same story. There were a total of 10 hospitals, unique hospitals who were identified as an outlier, a high outlier. And of those 10, only six of them were in common. So there's quite a difference in terms of which measure you use in terms of how you're gonna assess hospital quality. And this means that it's important really to take a look at these two different measures and try to get to the bottom of how they're different and which one should be used or whether they both should be used. But at any rate, it's gonna make a difference. It's not six of one half dozen or another. That's important because, for instance, New York State, uh, the federal government, MedPAR, all the MedPAR studies and everything used in hospital or 30 day mortality. Whereas, for instance, the CAT PCI database uses in hospital mortality. So you're going to come up with different outliers merely by the, by the fact that you're using different measures for them. And the question arises so which measure really is the best one, or do they both need to be used in concert with one another? This kind of shows a pictorial uh, representation of what I just said. I, you know, it, it shows that the correlation between the two measures, the in, the in hospital mortality only and the in hospital 30 day mortality, is negative. It's not significant as point P equal 0.1, but it is negative, meaning that uh, if you have a hospital that has more of one kind of deaths, uh, more of in hospital deaths, they're going to have, in general, fewer out of hospital deaths within 30 days and vice versa. You can see here at the left-hand end are the hospitals that have the most um, uh, in-hospital deaths. And for the most part, the red bars for them are lower than the red bars at the other end, which are the hospitals that have the fewest in-hospital deaths. So this again illustrates the fact that there's some kind of a compensation here between deaths occurring in hospital and out of hospital within 30 days. So conclusions, large percentage of these deaths occur following PCI, particularly among non-emergency patients. This is important to know because um, this means there really should be an effort to try to focus on reducing these deaths. It probably is gonna involve connecting with uh, primary care, with what happens to these patients after they leave the hospital, whether they have access to primary care, with, you know, what's going on with them. Um, also, is, uh, are there specific kinds of patients that are most in danger? You know, we know that the ones who go to um, hospitals and nursing homes are most in danger. We also know that rural patients are most in danger, probably because the access to primary care is more compromised. Um, the hospital risk-adjusted mortality uh, assessments, as I just mentioned, are very uh, sensitive to the inclusion of these deaths. And these pros and cons need to be examined carefully probably examined differently uh, based on the procedure that you're looking at. There may be different pros and cons merely based on, on what kind of procedure is being considered. Uh, here we're talking about PCI, of course. Uh, the pros include the need to focus on deaths after discharge because there's a pretty high percentage of them and uh, guarding against the danger of premature discharges. Of course, premature discharges of PCI, the, the length of stay is very short. So um, there are gonna be a lot of patients discharged within a day or two. Uh, cons includes deaths unrelated to the procedure hospitalization. Some of these deaths that occur 
after discharge, maybe a lot of them are not related to the procedure itself. And so uh, it may, may be regarded as unfair to be including those in a risk adjusted mortality measure. Uh, so I'll stop at that point and uh, entertain any questions or comments you have. Thank you very much. I think that was an, an, an incredible uh, 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 analysis. And I want to congratulate you and uh, your co-authors uh, on a very interesting and certainly thought-provoking um, um, study. I think, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll direct my first question to Dr. Jacobs, who I believe also was, in, uh, was involved uh, in the analysis. Um, you know, do you, uh, and certainly Dr. Hannon, you can jump in with this as well since you guys both know it. Is there any thought about uh, why, you know, certainly what I find most, well, one of the things I find most concerning is thinking that the non-emergent patients who get a PCI are the folks who are more likely to um, uh, have higher rates of mortality after discharge, and particularly in this day and age with things like same-day discharge, which, you know, we're doing very frequently, certainly at the centers where I practice, um, you know, that in of itself is concerning. Is, was, did your data, uh, was your data able to identify any, um, uh, indicators of what might increase uh, the risk of death for this population of patients? Was it related to medication uh, compliance? Was it related to follow-up time? Was it related to certain comorbidities or presence of ACS? Uh, anything that, that, that you were able to identify? So thank you. That's a very good question. Um, we don't really have details on the cause of death. And really what stimulated the study was a lot of um, concern and questions about using 30-day mortality following PCI. First, there's a lot of concern about mortality as a quality measure in general for PCI in hospital death is, is low. And does that really separate hospitals? That's one concern whether 30 day mortality is a better measure of that. And so we really wanted to look at a more granular view of the differences between in hospital and 30 day mortality. And it's not really surprising that the lower risk patients have a higher mortality when they get out of the hospital because it's lower when they're in the hospital. Um, and then with you know the focus on social determinants of health and follow-up and transitional care management, this has really become important now. You know, health equity, I work in a safety net hospital, the things we do outside the hospital are really more and more impressive. And so um, we don't, although we don't know the cause of death, we, we don't really know the answer to this question. We just wanted to stimulate the question of whether 30-day mortality is something we should use, how do we do attribution? Um, you know, if particularly if we don't know it's the cause of death, how do we care for patients once they leave the hospital and so forth? And that really was, um, you know, what informed the study questions. Well, then I will, I'll, I'll, I'll bounce off of that and ask our other panelist, Dr. Herschel, should we be using 30-day uh, mortality as a quality measure based on, you know, your experience, but as well as the data that was just presented by, by Dr. Hannon and Dr. Jacobs, not to put you on the spot. Well, you know, our, no, I, it's not on the spot at all. I, I, our, our profession has been wrestling with this metric for 40 years, and, and we've been trying for a long time to figure out what it means. Um, and I was delighted to, when I saw this manuscript, because I thought this is really good benchmarking information in terms of what goes on in the real world. And you know, we all of us in the field really respected the New York State program for years. And this is a really nice feature of it. However, I, there's two things I'd like people to think about. The first is um, this is a very heterogeneous group of patients. This is an all-comer study. Uh, and Consequently, there's probably many, many different types of deaths, many different mechanisms of deaths. Uh, and there may be deaths that are, in fact, there likely are deaths that are in spite of the procedure rather than because of the procedure. Um, and so lacking the information of the cause of death and the mechanism of the death, it's really pretty hard to, to draw a conclusion about it the role of the PCI. Uh, the other thing I thought I would suggest is that these late deaths represent potentially, and this is potentially only, failures of case selection. Uh, I think it's more likely 
that these are people who had a successfully performed procedure, but the procedure didn't help them. Uh, and therefore, if you look back on it with 2020 hindsight, these were people who probably should not have undergone the procedure to begin with. Um, and rather than that they had some bad thing happen to them as a result of the uh, procedure. One way to examine that is if you look at the lowest risk group, uh, the late mortality in the lowest risk group of patients was one in 500 cases. So that would suggest to me that there are very, that the PCI itself is unlikely to be responsible for these deaths. So it's like much more likely comorbidities or either that there are other comorbidities or that the PCI didn't really address the underlying cardiovascular problem sufficiently to prevent uh, the patient going on to die. So one of the things I was hoping to ask Dr. Hannon was, how do you feel about trying to run all these deaths down and learn more about them so we know what the mechanisms of these deaths were? Uh, that's a very good question and very good comments. Um, the, you know, we really don't have the resources to do that kind of thing. Um, we can get a uh, cause of death. And in fact, you know, we've looked at cause of death, but frankly, I just don't trust the information that comes out of that. It comes from the vital statistics files. And um, most of these patients don't have an autopsy. Uh, and, you know, uh, frequently what happens is uh, without any other knowledge, cancer, something like that, uh, the default is to say it's a cardiac cause of death. Uh, because nobody knows what else happened. So I don't know, you know, it, it, is, it is true that if you look at this cause of death data that we have, and it could have been presented, that the cause of death is cardiac less often among patients uh, who die after discharge than it is among the ones who die in the hospital. But the percentages are still fairly high, and I just don't think there's enough information there just on cause of death and the trustworthiness of cause of death to really answer the kinds of questions that you asked. I think it's a very interesting uh, comment about um, these patients dying for other reasons and perhaps not having been uh, appropriate, I'll, I'll use the word, maybe that's uh, too strong a word for PCI in the first place. But um, I think that probably even gets into perhaps expanding what is called appropriateness for PCI, because right now the appropriateness criteria are based on, uh, you know, cardiac reasons. Is, is the patient, um, does the patient have sufficient uh, stenosis in order to get PCI, or could the, could the patient uh, fare just as well with medical therapy, et cetera? But it doesn't get at um, whether the patient has terminal cancer or things like that, that may mean that uh, PCI was still not beneficial because the patient was going to die anyway. So that may argue for trying to uh, expand what appropriateness really means. You know, John, I, I, um, I think your hypothesis, I, I, I'm not sure I would agree with your hypothesis that it wasn't appropriate. And if you look at um, the recent data from the ischemia trial that was presented at the American Heart Association meeting, now looking at seven year follow up, and these are in the, you know, the, um, non-emergency non patients that we've shown. If you look at that data, um, medical therapy versus PCI, the mortality was the same, but the mortality was lower in the invasive group, but their non-cardiac mortality was higher. It looked like maybe cancer or something else. So, and, and we know that PCI in a stable patient, particularly with single vessel disease, doesn't save lives. It really helps symptoms. So I think we really need to integrate all of this information that we're getting. And it's such an important question because the past two weeks, three of my patients, my clinic patients came in for elective, you know, non-emergency angioplasty. They all went home the same day. Think about that. When we started PCI, they were here a week. <laughs> So they all went home the same day. So it's a very relevant question, but I think we have to integrate all, all, all of the data. But uh, just, just pushing back on that a little bit, Alice, if, if um, the mortality rates are, are the same between the PCI and medical therapy, 
but the reason they're the same is that PCI has more non-cardiac deaths. That still raises the question about whether some of these non-cardiac deaths that occurred were among patients who maybe shouldn't have had PCI because they were terminal patients. Yeah, I, I don't think we know that from the ischemia trial. And I, you know, just in clinical practice, I think we have a high threshold to, to intervene on patients that have a terminal illness or, you know, or a shorter life expectancy unless they're very, very symptomatic. So I'm not certain. Well, Alice, uh, I think, and, and, and I, I think we do that a lot because we don't know. And we usually figure that it's worth a shot, and if it because it may be more helpful than we think it might be, and so we do it. And I think, actually, as, as I mentioned before, with current technology, PCI is a pretty safe procedure, and so I think we tend to default on not withholding it from somebody rather than withholding it because we think their comorbidities are more dominant. Part of the illness. That's fair. I, I, I'd like to ask Lee, I wanted to add, ask Dr. Hannon this question uh, as a, because you're the statistical guru in the group here. Um, when I looked at the data about the outliers, it seemed to me that this was the result of many, many comparisons. Uh, and each of the comparisons involved relatively small numbers of events. And so it seemed to me that what we're seeing, particularly in, for example, in the in the multiple column graph that you showed, is just statistical noise rather than something where we can I arbitrarily say that if someone is a statistical outlier, that that's a quality uh, measure. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, uh, I guess that you know there there are two ways of looking at it, and there. One argues in one direction and one in the other. When there are so few adverse events that occur, the impact of a small number of those can tilt a hospital from being an outlier to a non-outlier and vice versa. So in that sense, they're um, you know, maybe they're not they're maybe they're not sta as stable because uh, you know, one or two deaths or three deaths can make a, a big difference in terms of outlier status. On the other hand, when the um, adverse outcome rate is so low, it is difficult to become an outlier. And you have to have a pretty elevated mortality in relation to the overall uh, state in order to be an outlier for a procedure like PCI. So um, I think an argument could be made in, in either direction on you know, what that really means. But it, it is hard to be an outlier. Uh, because the, the mortality rate is so low. I think on uh, on that note, I think this has been a great and very lively discussion. I think certainly what I take away from it is we still have a lot more work to do to figure out what's the best way to assess quality metrics and you know how can we ensure that our patients are uh, receiving uh, the best care and how can we lower mortality in those uh, patient groups that are at risk. I want to thank uh, all of the panelists uh, for being uh, present today, Dr. Hirschfield, Dr. Jacobs, and Dr. Hannon for presenting your research. Um, and thank everybody for tuning into Conversations with Jay Sky. Thank you.